Dracula Daily, September 30th, Dr. Seward's Diary, 30th of September. Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. He had gotten his wife's wire just before starting. He is uncommonly clever, if one can judge from his face, and full of energy. If this journal be true, and judging by one's own wonderful experiences, it must be, he is also a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. After reading his account of it, I was prepared to meet a good specimen of manhood, but hardly the quiet business-like gentleman who came here today. Later. After lunch, Harker and his wife went back to their own room, and as I passed a while ago, I heard the click of the typewriter. They are hard at it. Mrs. Harker says that they are knitting together in chronological order every scrap of evidence they have. Harker has got the letters between the consignee of the boxes at Whitby and the carriers in London who took charge of them. He is now reading his wife's typescript of my diary. I wonder what they will make out of it. Here it is. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows that we had enough clues from the conduct of the patient's Renfield. The bundle of letters relating to the purchase of the house were with the typescript. Oh, if only we had them earlier, we might have saved poor Lucy. Stop. That way lies madness. Harker has gone back and is again collating his material. He says that by dinner time they will be able to show a whole connective narrative. He thinks that in the meantime I should see Renfield as hitherto he has been a sort of index into the coming and going of the Count. I hardly see this yet, but when I get at the dates, I suppose I shall. What a good thing that Mrs. Harker put my cylinders into type. We never could have found the dates otherwise. I found Renfield sitting placidly in his room with his hands folded, smiling benignly. At the moment he seemed as sane as any one I ever saw. I sat down and talked with him on a lot of subjects all of which he treated naturally. Then, of his own accord, spoke of going home, a subject he has never mentioned to my knowledge during his sojourn here. In fact, he spoke quite confidently of getting his discharge at once. I believe that, had I not had the chat with Harker and read the letters and the dates of his outbursts, I should have been prepared to sign for him after a brief time of observation. As it is, I am darkly suspicious. All those outbreaks were in some way linked to the proximity of the Count. What, then, does this absolute content mean? Can it be that his instinct is satisfied as to the vampire's ultimate triumph? Stay. He is himself zoophagous, and in his wild ravings outside the chapel door of the deserted house, he always spoke of Master. This all seems confirmation of our idea. However, after a while I came away. My friend is just a little too sane at present to make it safe to probe him too deep with questions. He might begin to think, and then, so I came away. I mistrust these quiet moods of his, so I have given the attendant a hint to look closely after him, and to have a straight waistcoat ready in case of need. Jonathan Harker's Journal 30th of September the station master was good enough to give me a line to his old companion, the station master at King's Cross, so that when I arrived there in the morning, I was able to ask him about the arrival of the boxes. He, too, put me at once in communication with the proper officials, and I saw that their tally was correct in the original invoice. The opportunities of acquiring an abnormal thirst had been here limited. A noble use of them had, however, been made, and again I was compelled to deal with the result of an ex post facto manner. From thence I went on to Carter Patterson's central office, where I met with the utmost courtesy. They looked up the transaction in their day-book and letter-book, and at once telephoned to their King's Cross office for more details. By good fortune, the men who did the teaming were waiting for work, and the official at once sent them over. Sending also by one of them the waybill and all the papers connected with the delivery of the boxes at Carfax. Here again I found the tally agreeing exactly. The carrier's men were able to supplement the paucity of the written words with few details. These were, I shortly found, connected almost solely with the dusty nature of the job, and of the consequent thirst engendered in their operations. On my affording an opportunity, 
through the medium of the currency of the realm, of the allaying, at a later period, this beneficial evil, one of the men remarked. That air house, governor, is the rummiest I ever was in. Blimey, but it ain't been touched since hundred years. There was dust that thick in place that you might have slept on it without it in your bones, and the place was neglected that you might have smelled old Jerusalem in it. But that old chapel, that took the sight, that it did. Me and my mate, we thought we wouldn't never get out quick enough. Lord, I wouldn't take less nor a quid a moment to stay there after dark. Having been in the house, I could well believe him, but if he knew what I know, he would, I think, have raised his terms. Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all the boxes which arrived at Whitby from Varna in the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at Carfax. There should be fifty of them there, unless any have since been moved, as from Dr. Seward's diary, I fear. I shall try to see the carter who took away the boxes from Carfax when Renfield attacked them. By following up this clue, we may learn a good deal. Later. Mina and I have worked all day, and we have put all the papers into order. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of September. I am so glad that I hardly know how to contain myself. It is, I suppose, the reaction from the haunting fear which I have had that this terrible affair and the reopening of his old wound might act detrimentally on Jonathan. I saw him leave for Whitby with as brave a face as I could, but I was sick with apprehension. The effort has, however, done him good. He was never so resolute, never so strong, never so full of volcanic energy as at present. It is just as that dear, good Professor Van Helsing said. He is true grit, and he improves under strain that would kill a weaker nature. He came back full of life and hope and determination. We have got everything in order for tonight. I feel myself quite wild with excitement. I suppose one ought to pity anything so hunted as is the Count. That is just it. This thing is not human, not even beast. To read Dr. Seward's account of poor Lucy's death and what followed is enough to dry up the springs of pity in one's heart. Later Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris arrived earlier than we expected. Dr. Seward was out on business, and had taken Jonathan with him, so I had to see them. It was to me a painful meeting, for it brought back all poor dear Lucy's hopes of only a few months ago. Of course they had heard Lucy speak of me, and it seemed that Dr. Van Helsing, too, has been quite blowing my trumpet, as Mr. Morris expressed it. Poor fellows! Neither of them is aware that I know all about the proposals they made to Lucy. They did not quite know what to do or say, as they were ignorant of the amount of my knowledge, so they had to keep on neutral subjects. However, I thought the matter over, and came to the conclusion that the best thing I could do would be to post them in affairs right up to date. I knew from Dr. Seward's diary that they had been at Lucy's death, her real death and that I need not fear to betray any secret before the time. So I told them, as well as I could, that I had read all the papers and diaries, and that my husband and I, having typewritten them, had just finished putting them in order. I gave them each a copy to read in the library. When Lord Godalming got his and turned it over, does make a pretty good pile, he said, Did you write all of this, Mrs. Harker? I nodded, and he went on. I don't quite see the drift of it, but you people are all so good and kind, and have been working so earnestly and so energetically, that all I can do is accept your ideas blindfold and try to help you. I have had one lesson already in accepting facts that should make a man humble to the last hour of his life. Besides, I know you loved my poor Lucy. Here he turned away and covered his face with his hands. I could hear the tears in his voice. Mr. Morris, with instinctive delicacy, just laid a hand for a moment on his shoulder and then walked quietly out of the room. I suppose there is something in woman's nature that makes a man free to break down before her and express his feelings on the tender or emotional side without feeling it derogatory to his manhood. For when Lord Godalming found himself alone with me, he sat down on the sofa and gave way utterly and openly. I sat down beside him and took his hand. I hope he didn't think it forward of me, and that if he ever thinks of it afterwards, he will never have such a thought. There I wrong him. I know he never will. 
He is too true a gentleman. I said to him, for I could see that his heart was breaking. I loved dear Lucy, and I know what she was to you, and what you were to her. She and I were like sisters, and now she is gone. Will you not let me be like a sister to you in your trouble? I know what sorrows you have had, though I cannot measure the depth of them. If sympathy and pity can help in your affliction, won't you let me be of some little service, for Lucy's sake? In an instant the poor fellow was overwhelmed with grief. It seemed to me that all that he had of late been suffering in silence found a vent at once. He grew quite hysterical, and raising his open hands, beat his palm together in perfect agony of grief. He stood up and then sat down again, and the tears rained down his cheeks. I felt an infinite pity for him, and opened my arms unthinkingly. With a sob he laid his head on my shoulder and cried like a wearied child whilst he shook with emotion. We women have something of a mother in us that makes us rise above smaller matters when the mother spirit is invoked. I felt this big sorrowing man's head resting on me, as though it were that of a baby that may some day lie on my bosom, and I stroked his hair as though he were my own child. I never thought at the time how strange it all was. After a little bit his sob ceased, and he raised himself with an apology, though he made no disguise of his emotion. He told me that for days and nights past, weary days and sleepless nights, he had been unable to speak with anyone, as a man must speak in his time of sorrow. There was no woman whose sympathy could be given to him, or with whom, owing to the terrible circumstance with which his sorrow was surrounded, he could speak freely. I know now how I suffered, he said, as he dried his eyes, but I do not know even yet, and none other can ever know how much your sweet sympathy has been to me to-day. I shall know better in time, and believe me that, though I am not ungrateful now, my gratitude will grow with my understanding. You will let me be like a brother, will you not, for all our lives, for dear Lucy's sake? For dear Lucy's sake, I said as we clasped hands. I am for your own sake, he added. For if a man's esteem and gratitude are ever worth the winning, you have won mine to-day and if ever the future should bring to you a time when you need a man's help, believe me, you will not call in vain. God grant that no such time may ever come to you to break the sunshine of your life, but if it should ever come, promise me that you will let me know. He was so earnest, and his sorrow was so fresh that I felt it would comfort him, so I said, I promise. As I came along the corridor I saw Mr. Morris looking out a window. He turned as he heard my footsteps. How is art? he said. Then, noticing my red eyes, he went on. Ah, I see you have been comforting him. Poor old fellow, he needs it. No one but a woman can help a man when he is in trouble of the heart, and he had no one to comfort him. He bore his own trouble so bravely that my heart bled for him. I saw the manuscript in his hand, and I knew that when he read it he would realize how much I knew. So I said to him, I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend, and will you come to me for comfort if you need it? You will know later on why I speak. He saw that I was in earnest, and stooping, took my hand, and raising it to his lips, kissed it. It seemed but poor comfort to so brave and unselfish a soul, and impulsively I bent over and kissed him. The tears rose in his eyes, and there was a momentary choking in his throat. He said quite calmly, Little girl, will you never regret that true-hearted kindness so long as you ever live? Then he went into the study to his friend. Little girl, the very words he had used to Lucy, and oh, but he proved himself a friend. Dr. Seward's Diary, 30th of September I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived, but had already studied the transcript of the various diaries and letters which Harker and his wonderful wife had made and arranged. Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men, of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea, and I can honestly say that, for the first time since I have lived in it, this old house seemed like home. When we had finished, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favor? I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. 
What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty that I could not refuse her. And there was no possible reason why I should, so I took her with me. When we went into the room, I told the old man that a lady would like to see him, to which he simply answered, Why? She is going through the house and wants to see everyone in it, I answered. Oh, very well, he said. Let her come in, by all means, but just wait a minute till I tidy up the place. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared, or was jealous of, some interference. When he had got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, Let the lady come in, and sat down on the edge of his bed with his head down, but with his eyelids raised so that he could see her as she entered. For a moment I thought that he might have some homicidal intent. I remembered how quiet he had been just before he attacked me in my own study. And I took care to stand where I could seize him at once if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness, which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is one of the qualities mad people respect most. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. Good evening, Mr. Renfield, said she. You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you. He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave way to one of wonder, which merged in doubt. Then, to my intense astonishment, he said, You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be, you know, for she's dead. Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, Oh, no, I have a husband of my own to whom I was married before I ever saw Dr. Seward, or he me. I am Mrs. Harker. Then what are you doing here? My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. Then don't stay. But why not? I thought that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker, any more than it was to me, so I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? His reply was simply contemptuous given in a pause from which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question! I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield, said Mrs. Harker, at once championing me. He replied to her with as much courtesy and respect as he has shown contempt to me. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is so loved and honored as our host, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, whom, being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate in a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates lean towards the errors of non causia and ignoratio elenchi. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I had ever met with, talking elemental philosophy, and with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wonder if it was Mrs. Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory. If this new phase was spontaneous, or in any way due to her unconscious influence, she must have some rare gift or power. We continued to talk for some time, and, seeing that he was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly as she began, to lead him to his favorite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that by consuming a multitude of living things, no matter how low on the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times, I held the belief so strongly that I had actually tried to take human life. The doctor here will bear me out that on one occasion I tried to kill him on the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation of my own body, of his life through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phase for the blood is the life. Though, indeed, the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarized the truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, doctor? 
I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew what to think or say. It was hard to imagine that I had seen him eat up his spiders and flies not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, so I told Mrs. Harker that it was time to leave. She came at once after saying pleasantly to Mr. Renfield, Goodbye, and I hope I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself. To which, to my astonishment, he replied, Goodbye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Art seemed more cheerful than he has been since Lucy first took ill, and Quincy is more like his own bright self than he has been in many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with an eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once and rushed up to me, saying, Ah, friend John, how goes all? Well, so I have been busy, for I come here to stay if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell. Madam Mina is with you? Yes. And her so fine husband? And Arthur and my friend Quincy, they are with you too? Good. As I drove to the house, I told him of what had passed and of how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Harker's suggestion. At which the professor interrupted me. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina! She has a man's brain, a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, and a woman's heart. That good God fashioned her for a purpose, believe me, when he made that so good combination. Friend John, up to now, has made that woman of help to us. After tonight she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. It is not good that she run a risk so great. We men are determined, nay, are we not pledged to destroy this monster? But it is no part for a woman. Even if she may not have armed, her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer, both in waking and from her nerves, and in sleep from her dreams. And besides, she is a young woman, and not so long married. There are many other things to think of for some time, if not now. You tell me she has wrote all, then she must consult with us. But tomorrow she say goodbye to his work, and we go alone. I agreed heartily with him, and then I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very one next to my own. He was amazed, and with great concern seemed to come on him. Oh, that we have known it before, he said, for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. However, that milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that, but go on our way to the end. Then he fell into silence and lasted till we entered my own gateway. Before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs. Harker, I am told, Madam Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all the things that have been up to this very moment. Not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, but up to this morning. But why not up to now? We have seen hitherto how good light all the little things have made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told is the worse for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking paper from her pockets, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this and tell me if it must go in? It is my record of today. I, too, have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial. But there is little in this except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely, and handed it back, saying, It need not go in if you do not wish it, but I pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you the more, and all of us, your friends, more honor you as well as more esteem and love. She took it back with another blush and a bright smile. And so, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner, and before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. The rest of us have already read everything, so when we meet in the study, we shall all be informed as to facts, and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of September When we met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of board or committee. Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right, 
and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next to the professor and Dr. Seward in the center. The professor said, I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers? We all expressed assent, and he went on. Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertaining for me, so we then can discuss how we shall act, and can take our own measure according. There are such things as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. I admit that at the first I was a skeptic. Were it not that through long years I have to train myself to keep an open mind, I could not have believed until such time as the fact thunder on my ear. See, see, I prove, I prove, alas! Had I known at the first what I know now, nay, had I even guessed at him, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who did love her. But that is gone, and we must work that other poor souls perish not whilst we can save. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting once. He is only stronger, and being stronger, have yet more power to work evil. This vampire, which is amongst us, is of himself so strong as a person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal, for his cunning be the growth of ages. He have still the aids of necromancy, which is, as his etymology imply, the divination of the dead. And all the dead that he can come nigh to are for him at command. He is brute, and more than brute, he is devil and callous, and the heart of him is not, he can, within limitations, appear at will when, and where, and in any forms that are to him. He can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the rat and the owl and the bat, the moth and the fox and the wolf. He can grow and become small, and he can at times vanish and come unknown. How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his where, and having found, how can we destroy? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake, and there may be consequence to much that we brave shudder. For if we fail in this our fight, he must surely win, and then, where end we? Life is nothings, I heed him not. But to fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him, that we henceforth become foul things of the night like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies of the souls of those we love best. To us forever are the gates of heaven shut, for who shall open them to us again? We go on for all time aboard by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the side of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case must we shrink? For me, I say no, but then I am old, and life with his sunshine, his fair places, his song of birds, his music and his love, lie far behind. You, others are young. Some have seen sorrow, but there are fair days yet in store. What say you? Whilst he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared, oh, so much, that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him when I saw his hand stretch out. But it was life to me to feel its touch. So strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. It does not even need a woman's love to hear its music. When the professor had done speaking, my husband looked in my eyes, and I in his, and there was no need for speaking between us. I answer for Mina and myself he said. Count me in, Professor, said Quincy Morris, laconically as usual. I am with you, said Lord Godalming, for Lucy's sake, if for no other reason. Dr. Seward simply nodded. The professor stood up and, laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand on either side. I took his right hand and Lord Godalming his left. Jonathan held my right hand with his left and stretched across to Mr. Morris. So as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. 
I felt my heart icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We resumed our places, and Dr. Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely, and in as business-like a way, as any other transaction of life. Well, you know what we have to contend against, but we, too, are not without strength. We have on our side the power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have sources of science, we are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. We are so free to act and think. In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered, and we are free to use them. We have self-devotion in such a cause, and an end to achieve which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict, and how the individual cannot. In fine, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and of this one in particular. All I have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much, but when the matter is one of life and death, nay, of more than either life or death, yet we must be satisfied, in the first place because we have to be, no other means is at our control, and secondly, because, after all, these things, tradition and superstition, are everything. Does not the belief in vampires rest for others? though not, alas, for us, on them? A year ago, which of us would have received such a possibility, in the midst of our scientific, skeptical, matter-of-fact nineteenth century? We even scouted a belief that we saw justified under our very eyes. Take it, then, that a vampire, and the belief in his limitations and his cure, rest for the moment on the same base. For, let me tell you, he is known everywhere that men have been. In old Greece, and old Rome, he flourished in Germany all over, in France, and in India, even in Chernice, and in China, so far from us in all ways. There even is he, and the peoples fear him at this day. He have followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, and the devil-begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, and the Magyar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon, and let me tell you, that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen in our own so unhappy experience. The vampire live on and cannot die by mere passing of time. He can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Even more we have seen amongst us that he can grow even younger, that his vital faculties grow strenuous and seem as though they refresh themselves when his special pabulum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did never see him eat. Never. He throws no shadow. He make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observe. He has the strengths of many on his hand. Witness again Jonathan when he shut the door against the wolves, and when he help him from the diligence too. He can transform himself to wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby, when he tear open the dog. He can be as bat as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby, and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house, and as my friend Quincy saw him at the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create. That noble ship's captain proved him of this, but, from what we know, the distance he can make this mist is limited, and it can only be round himself. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle of Dracula. He become so small we ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hair-breadth space at the tomb door. When once he find his way, come out from anything and into anything, no matter how close it be bound or even fused up with fire, solder you call it, he can see in the dark, no small power this, in the world of which one half shut from the light. Ah, but hear me, though. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. Nay, he is even more the prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some of nature's laws. Why, we know not. He may not enter anywhere at first, unless there be some of the household who bid him to come though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, 
as does that of all things at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom. If he be not at the place whither he is bound, he can only change himself at noon or by exact sunrise or sunset. These things are we told, and in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as he will within his limit, when he have his earth home, his coffin home, his hell home, the place unhallowed, as we saw when we went to the grave of the suicide at Whitby, still at other time he can only change when the time come. It is said, too, that he can only pass running water at the slack of the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of, and as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now when we resolve, to them he is nothing. But in the presence he take his place far off and silent with respect. There are others, too, which I shall tell you of, lest in our seeking we may need them. The branch of the wild rose on his coffin kept him that he move not from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him, so that he be true dead, and as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen it with our own eyes. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him if we obey what we know, but he is clever. I have asked my friend Arminius of Budapest University to make his record, and, from all the means that are, he tell me of what has been. He must, indeed, have been that Voivode Dracula who won his name against the Turk, over the great river on the very frontier of Turkey land. If it be so, then he was no common man, for in that time, and for centuries after, he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning and well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain and that iron resolution went with him to his grave, and even now are arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race, though now and again were scions who were held by their covals to have had dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Scholomance, against the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims that the tenth scholar as his due. In the records are such words as Stragoika, witch, or dog, and Pokol, Satan and hell, and in one manuscript this very Dracula is spoken of as vampire, which we all understand too well. There have been from the loins of this very one great man and good women, and their graves make sacred the earth where alone this foulness can dwell for it is not the least of its terrors that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good, in soil barren of holy memories it cannot rest. Whilst they were talking, Mr. Morris was looking steadily at the window, and he now got up quietly and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and then the professor went on. And now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan, that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. It seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain at the house beyond the wall where we look today, or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must trace. Here we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside the house came the sound of a pistol shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet, which, ricocheting from the top of the embrasure, struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet. Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did so, we heard Mr. Morris's voice without. Sorry, I fear I have alarmed you. I shall come in and tell you about it. A minute later, he came in and said, it was an idiotic thing of me to do, and I ask your pardon, Mrs. Harker, most sincerely, for I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is that whilst the professor was talking, there came a big bat and sat on the window sill. I have got such a horror of the damned brutes from recent events that I cannot stand them, and went out to have a shot, as I have been doing of late of evenings, whenever I have seen one. You used to laugh at me for it, then, Art. Did you hit it? asked Dr. Van Helsing. I don't know. 
I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood. Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. We must trace each of these boxes, and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair, or we must, so to speak, sterilize the earth, so that no more he can seek safety in it. Thus in the end we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset, and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. And now for you, Madame Mina, this night is the end until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such risk. When we part tonight, you no more must question. We shall tell you all in good time. We are men and able to bear, and you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in danger such as we are. All the men, even Jonathan, seemed relieved, but it did not seem to me that they should brave danger and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety, through care of me. But their minds were made up, and, though it was a bitter pill for me to swallow, I could say nothing, save to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. As there is no time to lose, I vote we have a look at this house right now. Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim. I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close, but I did not say anything, for I had a greater fear that if I appeared as the drag or hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of their councils altogether. They now have gone off to Carfax, which means to get into the house. Manlike, they had told me to go to bed and sleep, as if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger. I shall lie down and pretend to sleep lest Jonathan have some added anxiety about me when he returns. October 1st. Dr. Seward's Diary. 1st of October, 4 a.m. Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say that I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. I don't know but what, if you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits. I knew the man would not have said this without some cause, so I said, All right, I'll go now. And I asked the others to wait a few minutes for me, as I had to go see my patient. Take me with you, friend John, said the professor. His case in your diary interests me much, and it had bearing, too now and again on our case. I should much like to see him, and especially when his mind is disturbed. May I come also? asked Lord Godalming. Me too, said Quincy Morris. May I come? said Harker. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I had ever met with in a lunatic, and he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail with others entirely sane. We all four went into the room, but none of the others at first said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. This he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery and adduced his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. They will, perhaps, not mind sitting in judgment on my case. By the way, you have not introduced me. I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum did not strike me at the moment, and, besides, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner. So much of the habit of equality that I at once made the introduction. Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing, Mr. Quincy Morris of Texas, and Mr. Renfield, he shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming, I had the honor of seconding your father at the Wyndham. I grieve to know, by your holding the title, that he is no more. He was a man loved and honored by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of the burnt rum punch, much patronized on Derby Night. Mr. Morris, you should be proud of your great state. Its reception into the Union was a precedent which may have far-reaching effects hereafter when the pole and the tropics may hold alliance to the stars and stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement, 
when the Monroe Doctrine takes its true place as a political fable. What shall any man say of his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionized therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You, gentlemen, who by nationality, by heredity, or by possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world, I take witness that I am as sane as at least the majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties. And I am sure that you, Dr. Seward, humanitarian and medico jurist, as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered under exceptional circumstances. He made this last appeal with a courtly air of conviction, which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered. For my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored and I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity, and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I thought it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement, for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes. This did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, But I fear, Dr. Seward, that you hardly apprehend my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. Time presses, and in our implied agreement with the old scytheman it is of the essence of the contract. I am sure it is only necessary to put before so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward so simple, yet so momentous a wish to ensure its fulfillment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing the negative in my face, turned to the others and scrutinized them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on. Is it possible I have erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly, but at the same time, as I felt, brutally. There was a considerable pause, and then he said, slowly, Then I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession, Boon, privilege what you will. I am content to implore in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are the good ones, sound and unselfish, and spring from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, sir, into my heart, you would approve to the full the sentiments which animate me, nay, more, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friends. Again, he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another form or phase of his madness, and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of utmost intensity, his bushy eyebrows almost meeting at the fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as of one addressing an equal. Can you not tell frankly your reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that if you will satisfy even me, a stranger, without prejudice, and with the habit of keeping an open mind. Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk and on his own responsibility, the privilege you seek. He shook his head sadly and with a look of poignant regret on his face, the professor went on. Come, sir, bethink yourself. You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree, since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. If you will not help us in our effort to choose the wisest course, how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? Be wise and help us and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He still shook his head and said, Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete, and if I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment. But I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. 
I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave. So I went towards the door, simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door, a new change came over the patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared I was going to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless as he held up his two hands imploringly and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotions was militating against him, by restoring us more to our old relations, he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes, so I became a little more fixed in my manner, if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. I had previously seen something of the same constantly growing excitement in him, when he had to make some request of which at the time he had thought much such, for instance, as when he wanted a cat. And I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. My expectation was not realized, for, when he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on his knees and held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication, and poured forth a torrent of entreaty with the tears rolling down his cheeks and his whole face and form expressive of the deepest emotion. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward, oh, let me implore you, to let me out of this house at once. Send me away how you will and where you will, send keepers with me with whips and chains, let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacled and leg-ironed, even to the gowl, but let me go out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I am speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. You don't know whom you wrong, or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me, I may not tell. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, by your love and what is lost, by your hope that lives, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that I am sane and earnest now, that I am no lunatic in a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul? Oh, hear me, hear me, let me go, let me go, let me go. I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit, so I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly, no more of this, we have had quite enough already. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intently for several moments. Then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasion, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, last of our party, he said to me in a quiet, well-bred voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, do me the justice to bear in mind, later on, that I did what I could to convince you tonight. Jonathan Harker's Journal 1st of October, 5 a.m. I went with the party to search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I am so glad that she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Somehow, it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all. But now that her work is done, and that is due to her energy and brains and foresight that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells. She may well feel that her part is finished, and that she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, all a little upset by the scene with Mr. Renfield. When we came away from his room, we were silent till we got back to the study. Then Mr. Morris said to Dr. Seward, Say, Jack, if that man wasn't attempting a bluff, he is about the sanest lunatic I ever saw. I'm not sure, but I believe that he had some serious purpose. And if he had, it was pretty rough on him not to get a chance. Lord Godalming and I were silent, but Dr. Van Helsing added, Friend John, you know more of lunatics than I do, and I am glad of it, for I fear that if it had been me to decide, I would before that last hysterical outburst have given him free. But we live and learn, and in our present task we must take no chance. As my friend Quincy would say, all is best as they are. Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. I don't know but that I agree with you, 
If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him. But he seems so mixed up with the Count in an indexy kind of way that I'm afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he prayed with almost equal fever for a cat, and then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master, and he may want to get out to help him in some diabolical way. That horrid thing has the wolves and the rats, and his own kind to help him, so I suppose he isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly did seem earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best. These things, in conjunction with the wild work we have in hand, help to unnerve a man. The professor stepped over, and laying his hand on his shoulder, said in a grave, kindly way, Friend John, have no fear. We are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case. We can only do as we deem best. What else have we to hope for, except the pity of good God? Lord Godalming had slipped away for a few minutes, but now he returned. He held up a little silver whistle as he remarked. That old place may be full of rats, and if so, I've got an antidote on call. Having passed the wall, we took our way to the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight shone out. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag and took out a lot of things, which he laid on the step, sorting them into four little groups, evidently one for each. Then he spoke. My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need arms of many kinds. Our enemy is not merely spiritual. Remember that he has the strength of twenty men, and that, though our necks or our windpipes are of the common kind, and therefore breakable or crushable, his is not amenable to mere strength. A stronger man, or a body of men, more strong in all than him, can at certain times hold him, but they cannot hurt him, as we can be hurt by him. We must, therefore, guard ourselves from his touch. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me, I being nearest to him. Put these flowers round your neck. Here he handed me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. For other enemies more mundane, this revolver and this knife. And for aid in all, these so small electric lamps, which you can fasten to your breast, and for all, and above all at the last, this, which we must not desecrate needless. This was a portion of sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Now, he said, friend John, where are the skeleton keys? If so, that we can open the door, we need not break house by the window, as before at Miss Lucy's. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys. His mechanical dexterity as a surgeon, standing him in good stead. Presently, he got one to suit, and after a little play back and forward, the bolt yielded, and, with a rusty clang, shot back. We pressed on the door, the rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. It was startlingly like the image conveyed to me in Dr. Seward's diary of the opening of Mrs. Westenra's tomb. I fancy that the same idea seemed to strike the others, for with one accord they shrank back. The professor was the first to move, and stepped into the open door. In manus tuus domine, he said, crossing himself as he passed over the threshold. We closed the door behind us, lest when we should have lit our lamps we should possibly attract attention from the road. The professor carefully tried the lock, lest we might not be able to open it from within should we be in a hurry making our exit. Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded on our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell in all sorts of odd forms, as the rays crossed each other or the opacity of our bodies threw great shadows. I could not for my life get away from the feeling that there was someone else among us. I suppose it was the recollection, so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings, of that terrible experience in Transylvania. I think the feeling was common to us all, for I noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every new shadow, just as I felt myself doing. The whole place was thick with dust. The floor was seemingly inches deep, except where there were recent footsteps, in which, on holding down my lamp, I could see marks of hobnails where the dust was cracked. The walls were fluffy and heavy with dust, and in the corners were masses of spiders' webs, whereupon the dust had gathered, till they looked like old tattered rags as the weight had torn them partly down. On a table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with a time-yellowed label on each. 
They had been used several times, for on the table were several similar rents in the blanket of dust, similar to that exposed when the professor lifted them. He turned to me and said, You know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it, and you know it at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel? I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it. So I led the way, and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low, arched oaken door, ribbed with iron bands. This is the spot, said the professor as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house, copied from the file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on a bunch, and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door, a faint, malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gasps. But none of us ever expected such an odor as we encountered. None of the others had met the Count at all at close quarters. And when I had seen him, he was either in the fasting stage of his existence in his rooms, or he was gloated with fresh blood, in a ruined building open to the air, but here the place was small and close, and the disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell, as of some dry miasma, which came through the fouler air. But as to the odor itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills and morality with its pungent acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had itself become corrupt. Fuh! It sickens me to think. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end, but this was no ordinary case, and the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us the strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent of the first nauseous whiff, we one and all set about our work as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, The first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. We must then examine every hole and corner and cranny to see if we cannot get some clues as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky, and there were no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left of fifty. Once I got a fright for, seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door into the dark passage beyond, I looked too, and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the high lights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for, as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows, and resumed his inquiry. I turned my lamp in the direction, and stepped into the passage. There was no sign of anyone, as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind, but only the solid walls of the passage. There could be no hiding place even for him. I took it that fear had helped imagination, and said nothing. A few moments later I saw Morris step suddenly back from a corner, which he was examining. We all followed his movements with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us and we saw the whole mass of phosphorescence, which twinkled like stars. We all instinctively drew back. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door, which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, and which I had seen myself, he turned the key in the lock, drew the huge bolts, and swung the door open. Then, taking his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and after about a minute, three terriers came dashing around the corner of the house. Unconsciously, we had all moved towards the door, and as we moved, I noticed that the dust had been much disturbed. The boxes had been taken out and had been brought this way but even in the minute that had elapsed the number of the rats had vastly increased. They seemed to swarm over the place all at once, till the lamplight, shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering, baleful eyes, made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies. The dogs dashed on, but at the threshold suddenly stopped and snarled, and then, simultaneously lifting their noses, began to howl in most lugubrious fashion. The rats were multiplying in thousands, and we moved out. 
Lord Godalming lifted one of the dogs, and carrying him in, placed him on the floor. The instant his feet touched the ground, he seemed to recover his courage, and rushed at his natural enemies. They fled before him so fast before he had shaken the life out of a score, the other dogs, who had now been lifted in the same manner, had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished. With their going it seemed as if some evil presence had departed, for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts for their prostrate foes, and turned them over and over and tossed them into the air with vicious shakes. We all seemed to find our spirits rise, whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere by the opening of the chapel door, or the relief which we experienced by finding ourselves in the open I do not know. But most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe, and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance. Though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution, we closed the outer door and barred and locked it, and bringing the dogs with us began to search of the house. We found nothing throughout except dust in extraordinary proportions and all untouched save for my own footsteps when I had made my first visit. Never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness, and even when we returned to the chapel they frisked about as though they had been a rabbit hunting in a summer wood. The morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front. Dr. Van Helsing had taken a key of the hall door from the bunch, and locked the door in orthodox fashion, putting the key into his pocket when he had done. So far, he said, our night has been eminently successful. No harm has come to us such as I feared might be, and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. More than all do I rejoice that this, our first and perhaps most difficult and dangerous step, has been accomplished without bringing therein to our most sweet Madame Mina, or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget. One lesson, too, which we have learned, if it be allowable to argue such a particulare, that the brute beasts which are to the Count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spiritual power. For, look, these rats that would come to his call, just as from the castle top he summoned the wolves, to your going and to that poor mother's cry, though they come to him, they run pell-mell from the so little dogs of my friend Arthur. We have other matters before us, other dangers, other fears, and that monster, he has not used his power over the brute world for the only or for the last time tonight. So be it that he has gone elsewhere. Good. It has given us opportunity to cry check in some ways in this chess game, which we play for the stake of human souls. And now let us go home. The dawn is close at hand, and we have reason to be content with our night's work. It may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow, if full of peril. But we must go on, and from no danger shall we shrink. The house was silent when we got back, save for some poor creature who was screaming away in one of the distant wards, a low moaning sound from Renfield's room. The poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself, after the manner of the insane, with needless thoughts of pain. I came tiptoe into our room and found Mina asleep, breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it. She looks paler than usual. I hope the meeting tonight has not upset her. I am truly thankful that she is to be left out of our future work, and even of our deliberations. It is too great a strain for a woman to bear. I do not think so at first, but I know better now. Therefore I am glad that it is settled. There may be things which would frighten her to hear, and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell her if once she suspected that there was any concealment. Henceforth our work is to be a sealed book to her, till at least such time as we can tell her that all is finished, and the earth free from a monster of the netherworld. I dare say it will be difficult to begin to keep silence after such confidence as ours, but I must be resolute, and tomorrow I shall keep dark over tonight's doings. I shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened. I rest on the sofa so as not to disturb her. 1st of October later. I suppose it was natural that we should have all overslept ourselves, for the day was a busy one, and the night had no rest at all. Even Mina must have felt its exhaustion, for though I slept till the sun was high, I was awake before her, and had to call two or three times before she awoke. 
Indeed, she was so sound asleep that for a few seconds she did not recognize me, but looked at me with a sort of blank terror, as one who has been waked out of a bad dream. She complained a little of being tired, and I let her rest till later in the day. We know now of twenty-one boxes having been removed, and if it be that several were taken in any of these removals, we may be able to trace them all. Such will, of course, immensely simplify our labor, and the sooner the matter is attended to the better. I shall look up Thomas Snelling today. Dr. Seward's Diary, 1st of October It was towards noon when I was awakened by the professor walking into my room. He was more jolly and cheerful than usual, and it was quite evident that the last night's work has helped to take some of the brooding weight off of his mind. After going over the adventure of the night, he suddenly said, Your patient interests me much. May it be that with you I visit him this morning? Or if that you are too occupied, I can go alone if it may be. It is a new experience to me to find a lunatic who talk philosophy and reason so sound. I had some work to do, which pressed, so I told him that if he would go alone I would be glad, as then I should not have to keep him waiting. So I called an attendant and gave him the necessary instructions. Before the professor left the room, I cautioned him against getting any false impression from my patient. But, he answered, I want him to talk of himself and of his delusions as to consuming live things. He said to Madame Mina, as I see in your diary of yesterday, that he had once had such a belief. Why do you smile, friend John? Excuse me, I said, but the answer is here. I laid my hand on the typewritten matter. When our sane and learned lunatic made that very statement of how he used to consume life, his mouth was actually nauseous with the flies and the spiders which he had eaten just before Mrs. Harker entered the room. Van Helsing smiled in turn. Good, he said. Your memory is true, friend John. I should have remembered. And yet it is this very obliquity of thought and memory which makes mental disease such a fascinating study. Perhaps I may gain more knowledge out of the folly of this madman than I shall from teaching of the most wise. Who knows? I went on with my work, and before long was through that in hand. It seemed that the time had been very short indeed, but there was Van Helsing back in the study. Do I interrupt? He asked politely as he stood at the door. Not at all, I answered. Come in. My work is finished, and I am free. I can go with you now if you like. It is needless. I have seen him. Well? I fear that he does not appraise me at much. Our interview was short. When I entered his room, he was sitting on a stool in the center, with his elbows on his knees, and his face was the picture of sullen discontent. I spoke to him as cheerfully as I could, and with such measure of respect as I could assume. He made no reply whatsoever. Don't you know me? I asked. His answer was not reassuring. I know you well enough. You are the old fool Van Helsing. I wish you would take yourself and your idiotic brain theories somewhere else. Damn all thick-headed Dutchmen. Not a word more would he say, but sat in his implacable sullenness as indifferent to me as though I had not been in the room at all. Thus departed for this time any chance of learning from this so clever lunatic. So I shall go, if I may and cheer myself with a few happy words with that sweet soul Madame Mina. Friend John, it does rejoice me unspeakable that she is no more to be pained, no more to be worried about our terrible things. Though we shall miss her help, it is better so. I agree with you with all my heart, I answered earnestly, for I did not want to weaken him in this matter. Mrs. Harker is better out of it. Things are quite bad enough for us, all men of the world and who have been in many tight places in our time. But it is no place for a woman, and if she had remained in touch with the affair, it would in time infallibly have wrecked her. So Van Helsing has gone to confer with Mrs. Harker and Harker. Quincy and Art are all out following up the clues as to the earth boxes. I shall finish my round of work, and we shall meet tonight. Mina Harker's Journal 1st of October it is strange to me to be kept in the dark as I am today, after Jonathan's full confidence for so many years, to see him manifestly avoid certain matters, and those the most vital of all. This morning I slept late after the fatigues of yesterday, and though Jonathan was late too, he was the earlier. He spoke to me before he went out, 
never more sweetly or tenderly, but he never mentioned a word of what had happened in the visit to the Count's house. And yet he must have known how terribly anxious I was. Poor dear fellow. I suppose it must have distressed him even more than it did me. They all agreed that it was best that I should not be drawn further into this awful work, and I acquiesced. But to think that he keeps anything from me, and now I am crying like a silly fool. But when I know it comes from my husband's great love, and from the good, good wishes of those other strong men. That has done me good. Well, some day Jonathan will tell me all, and lest it should ever be that he should think for a moment that I kept anything from him. I still keep my journal as usual. Then, if he has feared of my trust, I shall show it to him, with every thought of my heart put down for his dear eyes to read. I feel strangely sad and low-spirited today. I suppose it is the reaction from such terrible excitement. Last night I went to bed when the men had gone, simply because they told me to. I didn't feel sleepy, and I did feel full of devouring anxiety. I kept thinking over everything that has been ever since Jonathan came to see me in London, and it all seems like a horrible tragedy, the fate pressing on relentlessly to some destined end. Everything that one does seems, no matter how right it may be, to bring on the very thing which is most to be deplored. If I hadn't gone to Whitby, perhaps poor Lucy would be with us now. She hadn't taken to visiting the churchyard till I came, and if she hadn't come there in the daytime with me, she wouldn't have walked there in her sleep. And if she hadn't gone there at night and asleep, that monster couldn't have destroyed her as he did. Oh, why did I ever go to Whitby? There now, crying again. I wonder what has come over me today. I must hide it from Jonathan, for if he knew that I had been crying twice in one morning— I, who never cried on my own accord, and whom he has never caused to shed a tear, the dear fellow would fret his heart out. I shall put a bold face on, and, if I do feel weepy, he shall never see it. I suppose it is one of the lessons that we poor women have to learn. I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of dogs and a lot of queer sounds, like praying on a very tumultuous scale from Mr. Renfield's room, which is somewhere under this. And then there was a silence over everything, silence so profound that it startled me, and I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent, the black shadows thrown by the moonlight seeming full of silent mystery of their own. Not a thing seemed to be stirring, but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate, so that a thin streak of white mist that crept with almost imperceptible slowness crossed the grass towards the house seeming to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I think that the digression of my thoughts must have done me good, for when I got back to bed I found a lethargy creeping over me. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got out and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading, and was now close up to the window, so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it were stealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and, though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognize the tones, some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was the sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed and pulled the clothes over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy, at least so I thought, but I must have fallen asleep, for, except dreams, I do not remember anything until the morning when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and a little time to realize where I was, and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, and was typical of the way that waking thoughts become merged in, or continued in, dreams. I thought that I was asleep, and waiting for Jonathan to come back. I was very anxious about him, and I was powerless to act. My feet and my hands and my brain were weighted, so that nothing could proceed at its usual pace. And so I slept uneasily and thought. Then it began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dank and cold. I put back the clothes from my face and found, to my surprise, that all was dim around. The gaslight which I had left lit for Jonathan, but turned down, came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I had shut the window before I had come to bed. I would have got out to make certain at that point, but some leaden lethargy seemed to chain my limbs and even my will. I lay still and endured, that was all. I closed my eyes but could still see through my eyelids, 
It is wonderful what tricks our dreams play us, and how conveniently we can imagine. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in, for I could see it like smoke, or with the white energy of boiling water pouring in, not through the window, but through the joinings of the door. It got thicker and thicker till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see the light of the gas shining like a red eye. Things began to whirl through my brain just as the cloudy column was now whirling in the room, and through it all came the scriptural words, A pillar of cloud by day, and a fire by night. Was it indeed some spiritual guidance that was coming to me in my sleep? But the pillar was composed of both day and night guiding, for the fire was in the red eye, which at the thought got a new fascination for me, till, as I looked, the fire divided, and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes, such as Lucy told me of in her momentary mental wandering. On the cliff, the dying sunlight struck the windows of St. Mary's Church. Suddenly the horror burst upon me that it was thus that Jonathan had seen those awful women growing into reality through the whirling mist in the moonlight. And in my dream I must have fainted, for all became black darkness. The last conscious effort which imagination was to show me, a livid white face bending over me out of the mist. I must be careful of such dreams, for they would unseat one's reason if there were too much of them. I would get Dr. Van Helsing or Dr. Seward to prescribe something for me which would make me sleep, only that I fear to alarm them. Such a dream at the present time would become woven into their fears for me. Tonight I shall strive hard to sleep naturally. If I do not, I shall tomorrow night get them to give me a dose of chloral that cannot hurt me for once, and it will give me a good night's sleep. Last night tired me more than if I had not slept at all. Jonathan Harker's Journal 1st of October, Evening I found Thomas Snelling in his house at Bethnal Green, but unhappily he was not in a condition to remember anything. The very prospect of beer which my expected coming had opened to him had proved too much, and he had begun too early on his expected debauch. I learned, however, from his wife, who had seemed a decent poor soul, that he was only the assailant to Smollett, who of the two mates was the responsible person. So off I drove to Walworth, and found Mr. Joseph Smollett at home, and in his shirt-sleeves, taking a late tea out of a saucer. He is a decent, intelligent fellow, distinctly a good, reliable type of workman, and with a headpiece of his own. I remembered all about the incident of the boxes, and from a wonderful dog's-eared notebook, which he produced from some mysterious receptacle about the seat of his trousers, and which had hierographical entries in thick, half-obliterated pencil, he gave me the destinations of the boxes. There were, he said, six in the cartload, which he took from Carfax and left at 197 Chicksand Street, Mile End, Newtown, and another six which he deposited at Jamaica Lane, Bermondsey. If the Count meant to scatter these ghastly refuges all over London, these places were chosen as the first of delivery, so that later he might distribute more fully. The systematic manner in which this was done made me think that he could not mean to confine himself to two sides of London. He was now fixed on the far east of the northern shore, on the east of the southern shore, and on the south. The north and west were surely never meant to be left out of his diabolical scheme, let alone the city itself and the very heart of fashionable London in the southwest and west. I went back to Smollett and asked if he could tell us if any other boxes had been taken from Carfax. He replied, Well, Gemna, you've treated me very handsome. I had given him half a sovereign. And I'll tell you all I know. I heard a man by the name Bloxham say four nights ago, in the Aaron, Owns, and Pincher's Alley, as how he and his mates had had a rare dusty job in an old house at Perfect. There ain't a many such jobs as this year, and I'm thinking that maybe Sam Bloxham could tell me some it. I asked if he could tell me where to find him. I told him that if he could get me an address, it would be worth another half-sovereign to him. So he gulped down the rest of his tea and stood up, saying that he was going to begin the search then and there. At the door he stopped and said, Look ye, Gevna, there ain't no sense in me a-keepin' ye here. I may find Sam soon, or I mayn't. But anyhow, 
He ain't like to be in any way to tell ye much tonight. Sam is a rare one when he starts on the booze. If you can give me an envelope with a stamp on it, and put your address on it, I'll find out where Sam is to be and post it to ye tonight. But ye'd better be up arter I'm soon in the morning, or maybe ye won't catch him, for Sam gets off main early, and never mind the booze the night before. This was all practical, so one of the children went off with a penny to buy an envelope and a sheet of paper, and to keep the change. When she came back, I addressed the envelope and stamped it, and when Smullen had again faithfully promised to post the address when he found, I took my way to home. We're on the track anyhow. I am tired tonight, and I want to sleep. Mina was fast asleep and looks a little too pale. Her eyes look as though she had been crying. Poor dear, I've no doubt it frets her to be kept in the dark, and it may make her doubly anxious about me and the others. But it is best as it is. It is better to be disappointed and worried in such a way now than to have her nerve broken. The doctors were quite right to insist on her being kept out of this dreadful business. I must be firm, for on me this particular burden of silence must rest. I shall not ever enter on the subject with her under any circumstances. Indeed, it may not be hard task after all, for she herself is becoming reticent on the subject, and has not spoken of the Count or his doings ever since we told her of our decision. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st of October I am puzzled afresh about Mernfield. His moods change so rapidly that I find it difficult to keep touch of them. And as they always mean something more than his own well-being, they form a more than interesting study. This morning, when I went to see him after his repulse of Van Helsing, his manner was that of a man commanding destiny. He was, in fact, commanding destiny, subjectively. He did not really care for any of the things of mere earth. He was in the clouds and looked down on all the weaknesses and wants of us poor mortals. I thought I would improve the occasion and learn something, so I asked him. What about the flies these times? He smiled on me in quite a superior sort of way, such a smile as would come from the face of Malvolio as he answered me. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic faculties. The ancients did well when they typified the soul as the butterfly. I thought I would push his analogy to its utmost logically, so I said quickly, Oh, it is a soul you are after now, is it? His madness foiled his reason, and a puzzled look spread over his face as, shaking his head with a decision which I had but seldom seen in him, he said, Oh no, oh no, I want no souls. Life is all I want. Here he brightened up. I am pretty indifferent about it at present. Life is all right. I have all I want. You must get a new patient, doctor, if you wish to study zoophagy. This puzzled me a bit, so I drew him on. Then you command life. You are a god, I suppose? He smiled with an ineffably benign superiority. Oh, no, far be it from me to arrogate myself the attributes of a deity. I am not even concerned as his especially spiritual doings. If I may state my intellectual position, I am, so far as concerns things purely terrestrial, somewhat in the position which Enoch occupied spiritually. This was a poser to me. I could not, at the moment, recall Enoch's appositiveness, so I had to ask a simple question, though I felt that by doing so I was lowering myself in the eyes of the lunatic. And why with Enoch? Because he walked with God. I could not see the analogy, but did not like to admit it, so I harked back to what he had denied. So you don't care about life, and you don't want souls. Why not? I put my question quickly and somewhat sternly, on purpose to disconcert him. The effort succeeded. For an instant he unconsciously relapsed into his old servile manner, bent low before me, and actually fawned upon me as he replied. I don't want souls, indeed, indeed, I don't. I couldn't use them if I had them. They would be of no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them, or... He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face, like a wind sweep on the surface of the water. And, doctor, as to life, what is it, after all? When you've got all you require, and you know that you will never want, that is all. I have friends, good friends, like you, Dr. Seward. This was said with a leer of inexpressible cunning. 
I know that I shall never lack the means of life. I think that through the cloudiness of his insanity he saw some antagonism in me, for he at once fell back on the last refuge of such as he, a dogged silence. After a short time I saw for the present that it was useless to speak to him. He was sulky, and so I came away. Later in the day he sent for me. Ordinarily I would not have come without special reason. But just at present I am so interested in him that I would gladly make an effort. Besides, I am glad to have anything to help pass the time. Harker is out, following up clues, and so are Lord Godalming and Quincy. Van Helsing sits in my study, poring over the record prepared by the Harkers. He seems to think that by accurate knowledge of all details he will light upon some clue. He does not wish to be disturbed in the work, though, without cause. I would have taken him with me to see the patient, only I thought that after his last repulse he might not care to go again. There was also another reason. Renfield might not speak so freely before a third person as when he and I were alone. I found him sitting in the middle of the floor on his stool, a pose which is generally indicative of some mental energy on his part. When I came in, he said at once, as though the question had been waiting on his lips, What about souls? It was evident, then, that my surmise had been correct. Unconscious cerebration was doing its work, even with a lunatic. I determined to have the matter out. What about them yourself? I asked. He did not reply for a moment, but looked all around him, and up and down as though he expected to find some inspiration for an answer. I don't want any souls, he said in a feeble, apologetic way. The matter only seemed preying on his mind, and so I determined to use it, to be cruel only to be kind. So I said, you like life, and you want life? Oh, yes, but that is all right. You needn't worry about that. But, I asked, how are we to get the life without getting the soul also? This seemed to puzzle him, so I followed it up. A nice time you'll have, some time when you're flying out there, and the souls of thousands of flies and spiders and birds and cats buzzing and twittering and meowing all around you. You've got their lives, you know, and you must put up with their souls. Something seemed to affect his imagination, for he put his fingers to his ears and shut his eyes, screwing them up tightly just as a boy does when his face is being soaped. There was something pathetic in it that touched me, and it gave me a lesson, for it seemed that before me was a child, only a child, though the features were worn and the stubble on his jaws was white. It was evident that he was undergoing some process of mental disturbance, and knowing how his past moods had interpreted things seemingly foreign to himself, I thought I would enter into his mind as well as I could and go with him. The first step was to restore confidence, so I asked him, speaking pretty loud so that he would hear me through his closed ears. Would you like some sugar to get your flies round again? He seemed to wake up all at once and shook his head. With a laugh, he replied, Not much. Flies are poor things, after all. After a pause, he added, But I don't want their souls buzzing round me, all the same. Or spiders, I went on. Blow spiders. What's the use of spiders? There isn't anything in them to eat or... He stopped suddenly, as though reminded of a forbidden topic. So, so, I thought to myself. This is the second time he was suddenly stopped at the word drink. What does it mean? Renfield seemed himself aware of having made a lapse, for he hurried on, as though to distract my attention from it. I don't take any stock at all in such matters. Rats and mice and such small deer, as Shakespeare has it, chicken feed of the larder, they might be called. I'm past all that sort of nonsense. You might as well ask a man to eat molecules with a pair of chopsticks as to try and interest me about the lesser carnivora, when I know of what is before me. I see, I said. You want big things that you can make your teeth meet in? How would you like to breakfast on an elephant? What a ridiculous nonsense you are talking. He was getting too wide awake, so I thought I would press him hard. I wonder, I said reflectively, what an elephant's soul is like. The effect I desired was obtained, for he at once fell from his high horse and became a child again. I don't want an elephant's soul, or any soul at all, he said. For a few moments he sat despondently. Suddenly he jumped to his feet, and with his eyes blazing, and all the signs of intense cerebral excitement, To hell with you and your souls, he shouted. 
What do you plague me about souls? Haven't I got enough to worry and pain and distract me already without thinking of souls? He looked so hostile that I thought he was in for another homicidal fit, so I blew my whistle. The instant, however, that I did so, he became calm and said apologetically, Forgive me, doctor. I forgot myself. You do not need any help. I am so worried in my mind that I am apt to be irritable. If you only knew the problem I have to face, and that I am working out, you would pity and tolerate and pardon me. Pray do not put me in a straight waistcoat. I want to think and cannot think freely when my body is confined. I am sure you will understand. He had evidently self-control, so when the attendants came I told them not to mind, and they withdrew. Renfield watched them go. When the door was closed, he said, with considerable dignity and sweetness, Dr. Seward, you have been very considerate towards me. Believe me that I am very, very grateful to you. I thought it well to leave him in this mood, and so I came away. There is certainly something to ponder over this man's state. Several points seem to make that the American interviewer calls a story. If one could only get them in proper order, here they are. Will not mention drinking. Fears the thought of being burdened with the soul of anything. Has no dread of wanting life in the future. Despises the meaner forms of life altogether, though he dreads being haunted by their souls. Logically all these things point one way. He has assurance of some kind that he will acquire a higher life. He dreads the consequence, the burden of a soul. Then it is a human life he looks to. And the assurance? Merciful God, the Count has been to him, and there is some new scheme of terror afoot. Later. I went after my round to Van Helsing and told him of my suspicion. He grew very grave, and, after thinking the matter over for a while, asked me to take him to Renfield. I did so. As we came to the door, we heard the lunatic within singing gaily, as he used to do in the time which now seems so long ago. When we entered, we saw with amazement that he had spread out his sugars as of old. The flies, lethargic with the autumn, were beginning to buzz into the room. We tried to make him talk of the subject of our previous conversation, but he would not attend. He went on with his singing, just as though we had not been present. He had got a scrap of paper and was folding it into a notebook. We had to come away as ignorant as we went in. His is a curious case indeed. We must watch him tonight. Letter, Mitchell, Sons, and Candy, to Lord Godalming, 1st of October. My lord, we are at all times only too happy to meet your wishes. We beg, with regard to the desire of your lordship, expressed by Mr. Harker in your behalf, to supply the following information concerning the sale and purchase of number 347 Piccadilly. The original vendors are the executors of the late Mr. Archibald Winter Suffield, the purchaser is a foreign nobleman, Count de Ville, who effected the purchase himself, paying the purchase money and notes over the counter. If your lordship will pardon us using so vulgar an expression, beyond this we know nothing whatever of him. We are, my lord, your lordship's humble servants, Mitchell, Sons, and Candy. Letter 